what part does the mayor play in politics and in, in the city? What, is, what does actually the mayor do uh, in the city? It, it appears to me that over the last maybe 20 years when a mayor is elected, they kind of uh, disappear. You know, you see more of the mayor in Batman movies than you do in, in real life. Hello, everyone. Hola, mis amigos. You're listening to Oh My God, Hi, Hijo de Dios. Hola. With me, George Lopez. Porque sabes que let's do the show. Porque I got a lot of things to do. Thing I got to go that dry cleaner. Right here. My kid Phelps. Se pegó la cabeza. I got to go get some Neil Sport Sport and Paul. You know what George is? Oh, I'm sure he's around here somewhere. What's his name? George Lopez. George Lopez. Oh my God. OMG. OMG. Hi. Oh my God. Hi. Gentlemen, Father's Day is just around the corner, and our friends at Manscaped are here to ensure that all the father figures out there are looking daddy material this June. So Manscaped's Performance Package 4.0, which includes their signature lawnmower 4.0, is the perfect bundle to tackle any and all old man hair from head to toe. Uh, this right here is no dad joke. Treat him and yourself, and join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer. You can get 20% off plus free shipping with the code OMGHI at manscaped.com. Trust me, his dad bod will thank you. Our guest today called me and said, is this the place where people go and speak freely? And I said, yes, yes, sir, it is. And you can come on and speak freely whenever you want. The fact that he is not in uniform tells me that he, he's ready to get down and tell the truth. And it's not about his position, it's about him, I believe, as a man in the business of law enforcement in, a, in one of the biggest cities in the world who, you know, um, gets vilified and, and, and targeted because of his position of power, not really about the job that he's done. So with that, Grant, Beautiful. I mean, I, would you introduce bad. our guest? Absolutely, joining us. Uh, you know what, Gil, you do it, Cody, because I mean, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am honored to have the privilege to introduce the sheriff of Los Angeles County, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Alex Villanueva. Sheriff, welcome to Oh My God High podcast. It's an honor to be here with you, and of course, you know I'm a loyal follower anyway. Well, thank you, Gil, for and George for the invitation. It's great to see all of you. And I'm unfamiliar with the man in the middle right there. Oh, howdy! I'm Grant. I produced the show. <laughs> you, oh, sold, there you, go. you know what? I think the statute of limitations can can has run out. But he sold a lot of stolen property out of his house in high school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Alex. Um, with the election coming up, right? The election's coming up. Election's coming up. Um. um uh, give us your uh, give us where you are today, where you where you are as a man and as a as a sheriff today. Well, today we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I had a meeting at a, a press conference downtown L.A. talking about the MTA and talking about getting all the homeless off the train so people can ride the train without stepping over bodies. You know, common sense things. And my opponents were busy doing a kabuki theater at Loyola Marymount Law School talking about phantom gangs so you can't really you know juxtapose the two positions right there uh, you know that that's uh it's, it's that's right you know <clears throat> one of the issues i think that we talked about was the homeless crisis in 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 the los angeles in los angeles county um uh, talk to us a little bit about um how how the situation has 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 become I mean, really clearly you see, I mean, Alex, I mean, you know, you see all the people around. What, what, where are we as a city in combating this? And, and how much of, how much of what's out there is, because I think people are talking about people who are mentally ill, which, which, yeah. But how much, how, what, what's the situation with the homelessness in Los Angeles um, right now? Well, right now we're, we're in pretty bad shape. We're the nation's capital for homelessness. A full one quarter of the entire nation's homeless are now in L.A. County. Wow, and that is literally by design because we have the county, the city of LA, they've all decided one, not to do anything about the homeless, throw a lot of money at the homeless industrial complex, 
and then are amazed that it's exploding. And yeah, great weather, great dope, and free stuff everywhere. What's not to like about coming to LA, right? Right, exactly. Um, yeah, so so what are some of the... Can we break down, you think, logist, in, a, in a category of, of how many people are homeless? The pandemic, I'm sure, activated a lot of people who were just kind of living from pay, paycheck to paycheck, which is more common than I think people think. And then people who are... I mean, listen, man. I mean, it's 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 got to be for a better lack of a better term. It's, it's a bit of um, you know everybody's so sensible what they say, but if you were somebody that was living paycheck to paycheck and you ended up on the street, you would have to consider yourself in another world to be a homeless person now, right? Yes, and we're looking at about seventy percent of our homeless, and this is about eighty thousand people that are on the streets right now. About seventy percent of them suffer either mental illness drug abuse or a combination of both right so that leaves about 30 percent that might be victims economic circumstances they might be drifters that like the lifestyle and i've actually heard that from actual homeless people that they're there by their own free will and uh, people that are caught up in losing their job in the pandemic illnesses that puts them out of work bankruptcies bad relationships but those are the people that are actually the easiest to gain to get shelter because they want to get a roof over their head. They're not here to make a statement by, I'm homeless and I love it, or I'm you know, just going to live in a tent and take a crap on the sidewalk. Right. These are people that actually want to improve their circumstances, and they're the easiest to, to get shelter. It's the 70% that's the harder problem. But also, you have to say that there's, there's an element of the people who live in these neighborhoods who either leave bikes on their porch who get packages delivered to their house during the day, who leave who leave things in their car, and who get their cars broken into and their bikes taken and their packages taken, taken, and they will say the crime is coming up. But as a citizen or somebody that owns a home or somebody that parks their car on the street, you can't leave things in your car that you know if somebody sees, they're going to take. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it's not if it's not nailed down, you know, as they say in Spanish, se roban hasta los clavos de la cruz. <laughs> so, so you know, so so the amount of you know people who are on neighbor next door or on Citizen App and who will never will never tell anybody when they're doing a nice job or a good job. They only want to talk about how bad things are. But also in crime and in homelessness and in mental illness and, and drugs and people who just are happy to be out there, the people who are out there also have a responsibility uh, to maybe want to in, uh, uh, make their lives a little better. I think if you're mentally ill, you, you, you don't know where you are anyways. But but um, how how do we get go about to separate um, the wheat from the shaft, if you would say. Well, that's that's a, a tough problem we have right now because we have the willful and we have the ones that are unable. And by uh, mental illness or substance abuse, they are so far gone. And for that crowd, we need to have the, we need to build up the capacity. We don't have residential treatment for people with mental illness. In fact, we just keep closing mental hospitals and then we wonder why everyone's on the street walking around like zombies well duh we actually created the problem back in the 60s and 70s if uh if you're old enough to remember that and we've never built that capacity at the community level so now we're paying the price for the sins of you know three decades ago and it's come you know we gotta solve that right there okay i might have a i might have one possible solution if basketball season was starting today, could we give all the homeless people out there Clippers season tickets so they have a place to sit and to sleep while <laughs> while, while the Clippers? I don't want to say Clipper fans, but are you saying there's enough empty seat capacity there? <laughs> there might be. You know, and, and you know, it smells like pee already a little bit in there. Um, no, no, I'm kidding. But I think Gil wants to do the whole hour and a half and not say a word. So. <laughs> no, that's that, that's not true at all. I'm, I'm following the boss's lead. And, and and also with uh, with the mental facilities that are closing, with the hospitals that are closing, um, you know, do you, do you do you think that there's an element of people who want to stall you out because there is an election coming up and potentially have you removed that sheriff? 
Oh, yeah, definitely. They want to ride it out and see and hope that they'll get someone in office who's going to be their puppet. There'll be a sheriff on a leash. They'll have them roll over and do tricks, and they won't do anything. They'll never set a foot like on the Venice boardwalk or call out the failures of county government. But I'm not here to uh, pretend things are working great. If it's not working, hey, that ain't working. Let's fix it. And yeah. I think we can. But the first step is just like an alcoholic. You got to admit you got a problem. The county and the city never wants to admit that. Well, wow. you know, there was a problem. Uh, I haven't seen conflict like this since Baxter Ward and Peter Pitches. And when Baxter was with the Board of Supervisors, they bumped heads. But Peter Pitches eventually won. He was the solution. He won out. And the Board of Supervisors acquiesced. And we're hoping with your victory coming up that maybe there'll be less bumping of heads and people will learn that the right thing is being done. All it takes is three. That's it, the rule of three. I think we have two supervisors that are now supporting law enforcement, and that's Catherine Barger, and that's um, uh, Janice Hahn from the 4th District. The 3rd District is open, so we'll see who gets out of there. The 1st District is Hilda Solis. She's running for re-election. She refuses to campaign to do... Um, uh, candidate forums or debates with anybody. We've never seen one. Hmm. I don't know why she gets a free pass on that one. But uh, I think between the two, we're going to get at least one more vote with someone who's going to support just basic law and order, common sense stuff. So I think we got a positive future ahead. Why do the rest of the Board of Supervisors not want to uh, not want to do anything for the city? They've embraced the whole thing about law enforcement is bad and let's defund law enforcement. They want to replace cops with community-based organizations that basically are gonna to contribute to their re-election campaigns. It's all about rewarding their family and friends with contracts with service providers. That's how you make $7 billion disappear over 10 years and the homeless population explodes. And you wonder what happened. Well, they ran away with the money and we're left full in the bag. Certainly what you did in Venice uh, by cleaning up over there, uh, have they started coming back, or have we been successful in what you accomplished out there with the Sheriff's Department? We've been successful in keeping the boardwalk itself clear, but we've had a couple of migrations into like Centennial Park and a block inland from the boardwalk. So Venice is not out of the woods by any stretch, but it did show that when we work together, we can produce results. We just got to scale up the initiative countywide. And remember, FEMA, when there's a hurricane or a big thing, they'll house 50,000 people in a weekend. Yeah. And Red Cross, International Red Cross, you get a war and a million refugees, right. they get them housing. And yet here we are struggling with 83,000 people, and we wonder why we can't get the job done. You know, I think you think the homeless problem is getting worse when you see a two-story homeless Comp, like the guy had a two. I don't, I don't know how he did two stories because you know they, they they were trying to talk to him. He said, "I'll be right down." You know, I don't think I've never seen a homeless two story uh, house. I don't know how he got the boxes to to to. But but you know they're they're getting. I mean, not to make not to make light, but I make light of everything. Um, that you know they they become these camps under the un, under underpasses and at and at off ramps mm -hmm. and. Um, a lot of those people that you see are are very young. I'm not even sure if they're necessarily panhandlers anymore. That I don't see a lot of people, you know, at at on ramps on on ramps asking for money. I don't really see that as much as I see more of the encampments that people that homeless people stay at. Yeah, I see more people selling oranges and flowers than I do people panhandling. Yeah. that should kind of tell you something right there. You want to work, you can. God bless those people that have to. They get out there and sell oranges and flowers. Uh, they're yes. trying. In fact, George, I just heard a statistic last week. There's two jobs available for everyone who wants to work in the United States right now. Two. And then you got people that walk for two thousand miles to come to L.A. Yeah. They come to work. Come we to don't work. see them living under the freeway. You know, that's a very that's a very good point. That. Uh, that those people uh, uh, work every day, they're not asking to, for help, they would be embarrassed to, to, to be able to work and live outside. You know, I was working uh, part-time a year and a half ago a for a <laughs> uh, Department of uh, Children and Family Services, 
and right across the street from the building we were occupying, there was a homeless person there. There were a few homeless camping out there. Was it female? But I was shocked. No, it was a male. Okay. And he had a nickname. They call, Everybody called him Kong on the block. And I was shocked. One day, Kong was standing out on the corner. A UPS truck drove up to make a delivery. He was having stuff delivered to him right there on his corner. And and how they do this. Well, the Kong. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, in Los Angeles, I, th- I think um, the, the, we're, our history is more towards... <sighs> LAPD and the and the sheriff. I mean, the uh, captain of the LAPD. The is that what they call him? The captain? Who's the, what the was chief? Gates. The police chief. The police Sorry. chief of police. The, the chief of police was the guy who was taking all the heat in Los Angeles through all the years. And the sheriff seemed to me like I, I was telling Gil that the sheriff seemed to be the least aggressive of the of the crime fighting units between the LAPD. And then be real from Cypress Hill came in here. And said, oh, no, man, the sheriffs are the ones that you don't mess with. We didn't lie to the sheriffs. When they came into the neighborhood, we told them the truth because we respected them because they let us live. And they weren't in here just to kind of push people around and be bought. But, but they had. So I, I, I learned that the sheriffs in Los Angeles have the you know, respect of the community. But LAPD was the, the chief and all that stuff. That, but how, how, did, how, did, how is this not an issue with the Los Angeles Police Department? And how well, are you? You know, it can't. Yeah, it's right. kind of evolved over time. Remember, because we had Daryl Gates back in the eighties yeah. and nineties, the Rodney King riots. That was probably the probably the peak of that whole enforcement culture, the warrior thing, us versus them. And I think from that, there was definitely a turn in the other direction. Hey, let's start working, be part of the community, building relationships. So now it's all about a guardian model. It's about engagement, building relationships. Not sexy stuff that's made for a 60-minute TV, uh, you know, crime-fighting thing on TV, Mm -hmm. but it's actually what works because now we're perceived as the ones who are protecting the community as opposed to uh, an army of occupation. And and not knocking any, picking on anybody, but you mentioned Daryl Gates. Daryl Gates stood up to the city government back then. He protected his men and women. Uh, Chief Moore isn't as vociferous as Daryl Gates was and seems to acquiesce to whatever city wants him to do. And so it becomes problematic uh, for the members of the LAPD. And we're all in a business together. Yeah, that, that's always an issue now today with the appointed chiefs of police. They can't operate with the freedom that elected sheriffs because you guys are tech, you're my boss, literally. There's no one in between you and I. I just got to figure what 10 million people want. But going back to Gates... As conservative as he's been portrayed, he had the foresight way back in the 70s, Special Order 40, that he was not going to be involved in immigration enforcement. Him and the, he understood it was about public safety. So you got to, you know, he's easy to criticize, but at the same time, he was very, mm-hmm. you know, forward thinking in terms of what's the relationship between law enforcement and the community. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, how did how did you become an enemy of the Los Angeles Times? Oh, that was real easy. Um, as soon as I took office, one, I defeated their uh, endorsed candidate. So uh-huh. that was my cardinal sin one right there, because they want a sheriff who's uh-huh. subordinate to the board of supervisors. So by me being independent of the board, I'm public enemy number one right there. And now. In fact, when we took ICE out of the jails, that was a big deal nationally, except the LA Times just did an absolute blanket on it as if we never did anything. To this day, they had an article out yesterday talking about my time in office. They could not even mention it once because it's not part of their policy because they've crafted this false narrative that they've been working on for years to try to sell to the public that somehow I'm rogue when I'm actually just doing my job that I, the way I'm supposed to. Mm-hmm. And I'll work with the board, but I don't work for the board. I work for you guys. Thank you. Um, how many people sit on the board? We got five. Mm-hmm. And um, do those five get along? I mean, they have a lot of power. The Board of Supervisors seems to have a lot of power in Los Angeles. Oh, they are. That's why they've been called the five little kings forever. 
because they have unchecked power. They have no oversight. They have no transparency. They're not accountable to anybody, but get reelected every four years. Mm. And remember, they're both the legislative branch of government and the executive branch of government combined into one. So you want to talk about ultimate power trip, it's them. Yet they're the ones that will turn around and be moaning for me, at, for example, as sheriff. Yeah. That really sounds like the job that, that somebody would want to have other than uh, being the mayor of Los Angeles. Happy being a, who are the five people? Who are the, who are the five board of supervisors? We have um, Hilda Solis, District 1, Holly Mitchell, District 2, Sheila Kuehl, who's retiring, District 3, so it's open now in the election. Mm -hmm. The Janice Hahn in District 4, and Catherine Barger in District 5. Those are your, your five little kings right there. Do the people who, you know, have, have elections throughout all throughout the United States, do the people who, who vote and who do not vote, do they understand that an election is an election and they're all important that just like oh I'll I'll vote only when it's maybe the presidential election but do people the the everyday citizen understand that all of these elections matter you know what the uh, the amount of uh, of information or education of the electorate a lot of people don't really understand the role of local government for example they're all keen on who's yelling at who in Sacramento or in DC a lot of political theater, but the ones that actually makes or break their community is a supervisor, their local mayor, their local city council. Those are the, in the local DA, for example, or mm -hmm. like the one we have that doesn't do anything. That's the ones that affects your quality of life. You get It gets the least amount of attention. And I'll go a step further than that, uh, Sheriff. I don't believe that half the residents of L.A. County that live in incorporated areas understand that they vote for the sheriff and that they vote for the district attorney. Mm -hmm. They believe because they're an incorporated city, they have a chief of police, they have nothing to do with it. They do. Yep. It's every resident in Los Angeles, every voting resident in Los Angeles County, and that word has to get out. It, yeah, they need to that is very true. Yes, they need to understand that it's not just you know, in November every four years, but every every election. And also, if you're unhappy with what's happening in your district, pick up the phone and call, and call your council person. Oh, yes. We post the, the numbers for the Board of Supervisors online. Oh, they hate it because they don't want to hear from their constituents, especially when they screw up, which is most of the time. So, uh, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people hear the, the term defund the police, you know, um, explain to everybody what that that term means to defund the police. Well, the way the term was generated after the George Floyd protests. You have a group like uh, different type of anti-government groups, uh, Antifa crowd. You have the anarchists. They want to defund law enforcement. They, in fact, they call it the abolitionist movement. Movement. They want to get rid of law enforcement entirely. They want to get rid of the jails. They want to get rid of the prisons. And I guess they're assuming that everyone's going to sing Kumbaya when this happens. Mm. And uh, they want to re they call it reinvesting in the community. But the average taxpayer say, wait a minute, I'm breaking my butt paying property taxes. Half of it goes towards public education. And then you look at the county budget, the overwhelming majority goes to health and human services and welfare, all these different things. We get 10% roughly the county budget, 10%. And we're severely understaffed the way it is right now. So. Defunding means you're going to pay the consequences for someone else's social experiment. I think I just read some place this morning or yesterday where they're now realizing that maybe defunding the police was the wrong move. And hopefully after the elections, things will get back to let's refund the police and get them some what they desperately need, and that's money for more cops, money for more programs out on the streets that's going to help keep our residents safe. Yes, look at look at President Biden. He's been on TV now all of this month saying fund, fund, fund law enforcement. But our board hasn't got that memo for some reason. It's kind of weird because they're from the same party. I don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, what was I was going to say I forgot. What I was gonna, uh, um, how, oh, so so what 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 part does the mayor play in politics? 
and in in the city. What what does actually the mayor do uh, in the city? It, it appears to me that over the last maybe twenty years, when a mayor is elected, they kind of uh, disappear. You know, you see more of the mayor in Batman movies than you do in in real life. Like it, it's almost like Garcetti got elected. And just, I'm not sure where he goes, but the mayor used to be the spokesperson of the city. He would come out and maybe go to LAX when there was an issue or go somewhere where there was an issue and be the face and say, you know, hey, we're going to take control of the situation. But, I mean, this dude is like MIA. He goes wherever the cameras are. And I'm tired of hearing him call everybody Angelinos. Angelinos are from the city of Los Angeles. I'm not an Angelino. I live yeah. in the county of Los Angeles. I'm not an Angelino. And he goes, whether it's the city or not. He was just criticized recently with the uh, some kind of promotion they had going at the new football stadium uh, over in Inglewood. They were there announcing, and they, yet they didn't have other city council people there uh, that were, should have been there. Right. And yet Gar- Garcetti was there, and it has nothing to do with the city of Los Angeles. Right. Father's Day is coming up. we got a lot of hairy fathers out there, and so our friends at Manscaped are back. To tell us a little bit about what they got going on. So Manscaped is designed with fathers in mind, and their latest, the Performance Package 4.0, is here just in time for your pops and all the pops is out there. Special day. Inside this package, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, I love those, uh, and a travel bag to hold his goodies. First off, let me start by saying the Lawnmower 4.0 will be the official MVP of Father's Day. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade, get it, cutting edge? Cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. And the Lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 400K LED spotlight he needs for a more precise shave. We all know dads love their comfort, and with summer just around the corner, the Boxers 2.0 are also here to save every father from the uncomfortable heat down there. So, if you want to get 20% off plus free shipping with the code OMGHIGH at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code OMGHI. Shake what your mama gave you? Nah. Shake what your daddy gave you. But remember this, though, George. The, uh, when they when the city of L.A. voted on charter reform, they kind of mm-hmm. spayed and neutered the office of mayor to a degree and they shifted a lot of power to the city council. So that kind of lowered the ability of the mayor to be the chief executive and run all the city departments. Right. So now you got 15 little mini mayors right. and one ceremonial big mayor. So it didn't really help the situation. No, he has no power. I don't think he has the power if you have a 15 little mini mayors, right? They can't really. how, how much power That's, did Mark Ridley Thomas take away from the city? Oh, well, they're the prime example right there. And now you got people like Mike Bonin on one side of the coin, and then you got Joe Buscaino on the other side of the coin. One place has LAPD doing everything in their district, and the other one, LAPD has been told to stand down and just not do anything. And the residents are losing their mind over it. Yeah. I knew Joe Buscaino when he was a police officer. Um, where does he stand in the, in the whole? Does he want? Does he? Was he not running to be mayor of LA? He um, he um, uh, quit the race itself. His name is still on the ballot, I believe, but he endorsed um, Caruso for mayor. He just announced that about two weeks ago. He. His name is on, unfortunately, they're already printed up, so his name's gone on the ballot, but he is now endorsing Rick Caruso. So, so when, when Mayor Reardon was, uh, was mayor, he was, uh, I think, maybe a billionaire uh, uh, businessman who became mayor of Los Angeles, um, almost in the same vein as uh, Rick Caruso would be if he became mayor of uh, Los Angeles. Is it, um, why would a guy who, who has so much uh, money and freedom of, that, of his being a businessman want to become the mayor of Los Angeles I think it's pretty simple he he lives and breathes LA he's part of LA his entire fortune is invested in an LA if there's no future in LA it becomes some dystopian universe where every day looks like the movie The Purge well that's not exactly going to benefit anyone including him so I think he's taken on a bigger role that probably needs to be done do you believe that Yes, I do. 
Okay. I do. So he would be, I mean, I mean, uh, who's he running, he running against? Um, Karen Bass. Karen, Karen Bass. Bass. And, and they're just, uh, Karen Bass, who is there now publicly, one of the campaign thing, anti-campaign slogan, she was involved with uh, USC. And the thing that Mark Ridley Thomas is indicted for, she's also alleged to have received money from them, but not under indictment. But she's in, involved in that. And that's his biggest opponent. Does she have does she have momentum in this race? Does she have a possibility of winning? I think she hit a hard ceiling, and I don't think she's going to go past it because she's too associated with the status quo in Garcetti. Ah. And I don't think she's going to convince people more than preserving the status quo, which no one wants. So I think that's that's her hurdle to overcome. The uh, biggest thing, Sweet Alice and... Uh, Who's Sweet Alice? Sweet Alice is a local uh, activist in L.A. from who Watson. Is, who is that? Uh, she's, a, she's a lady that has been there. She's 82 years old. She's been a do-gooder for the city. That's not the lady that was at the Dodger games playing the tambourine in the 70s. No, 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 no. Sweet Alice is not. <laughs> and Snoop Dogg. Sweet Alice came out and endorsed uh, Rick Caruso, and Snoop Dogg came right on TV with her and said, hey, she's been embedded in this community. She's done everything for the people here. If Sweet Alice is endorsing them, I'm voting okay, for them. Okay, good. Snoop Dogg, Sweet Alice, two locals. This You're, you're not talking about big politicians. You're right. talking real people. And they're coming out. In a, I think it's probably the best thing that uh, hit the airwaves yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Alex, it has to it has to trip you out, man, that I'm, I'm pretty sure that not every person who's a sheriff has the goal to become, you know, the, the, the man in the department. But as, you, as you've come up in law enforcement, it has to trip you out that when you finally get a chance to be the guy that everybody is more concerned with you than they are with the issues in the city. Yeah, it's kind of a disconcerting you know, to see how, as it unfolds. But growing up, I saw Block, I saw Baca. In fact, I helped Baca get elected back in 98. And I saw how he squandered, you know, the goodwill coming into the office. He was just misled. Surround himself with the bad people. Gil can tell you about that. And then we go to McDonald. And then people trying to unseat Baca. So I helped people try to unseat back after his thing went sour. I helped Olmsted try to uh, win outright when the seat was open 14. So, you know, the saying is, you know, if you want to do it right, you got to do it yourself. So here we are. Um, yeah, exactly. I believe that. And, you know, <clears throat> um, I wish more people in just overall weren't as, uh, weren't as hate, I don't want to say hateful, man. We're as hateful and as and as negative as we've become. You know, politics was you, you didn't discuss religion and you didn't discuss politics. And in uh, people, they used to say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. But social media has created vipers out of kids, out of people, mm-hmm. out of everybody, and. I would hate to think that to live to be this old, 62, that looking back, things didn't get better when I left San Fernando High in 1979, that they got worse. And looking back, that we would be so hateful to each other, so hateful of of our communities, of politicians, and not believe that every day that you live in your city, that that city could get better if just people had a better overall attitude for their neighbors and for the uh, police officers and for people who unfortunately are living uh, on the streets. And just, you know, everyone overall, it's, it's so bad, man. You know, I live in a neighborhood where yesterday this lady was coming up the street, older lady, and I was coming down the street, and usually when people move out of the way, they would kind of wave. This lady, man, would have, if I would have stopped in front of her, she would have, we'd still be there in a standoff, I'm sure. And you just feel it <laughs> coming from the cars and coming from the people that there's not just this kind of goodwill towards citizens that is really very, very bad out there. Well, I believe social media gives people the ability to say whatever they want without having to be responsible for their actions. They can do whatever they want. They're hidden. They're no longer having to respond to anybody. They just say whatever they want, and they're not being held responsible. Uh, yeah, Exactly. 
I mean, I got out of politics. I mean, I helped Obama in 2008, and then I kind of wasn't really happy with the way he was going. And in 12, I did a little bit, but not so much. And, you know, that's all people want to tell me is that I don't do anything for my own people. I don't uh, – I made a mistake endorsing Biden, that I'm an idiot for helping Obama, and that I haven't done anything for the Latino community that I'm only concerned about myself. <laughs> You know, it's like, hey, I, I'm just a guy who started writing jokes on a gas company envelope. I'm not an elected official. If you like me, like me. And if you don't like me, don't like me. People say you made a mistake by allowing me on your show. That was grand. You said you'd keep that in confidence. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, you know, George, remember, everyone's, everything gets filtered down into the stupid phone, literally. If they can swipe it on the screen, Man. they see a screaming headline. No one bothers reads even the article or the second line of an article. That's too much misinformation that's so easy to manipulate. When when my grandmother was living and Antonio Villaraigosa was running for mayor the first time and James Hahn did a uh, commercial of someone smoking crack in the dark and it was a James Hahn commercial against Villaraigosa. And I went over to my grandmother's house and she says... Uh, and one thing my grandmother did tell me from the time I turned 18 was to vote. We voted in every election. And my grandmother said, I'm not going to vote for the Mexicano because he smokes crack. And I said, what? And she says, uh -huh. yeah, I saw him on TV that he smokes crack. I said, no, Grandma, that, that's a political ad. And you couldn't convince her that Antonio Rivergosa wasn't on the pipe. <laughs> and I think elderly people who live, when they see those things and don't read the articles, don't understand that those things are generated by an opposing political party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, now I have a uh, flyer that has me given the middle finger <laughs> to uh, L.A. County. And they did they Photoshop these photos. And it's real elaborate. And it comes from Oakland, from a group that put George Gascon in office. Yeah. And this is how they play the game. That's how they play the game. And yeah, let's talk about Gascon. How, how does how? Um, what is his background? The first, let's start. What is his background? Then we'll talk about him, him as a DA. Well, I know he uh, immigrated his family from Cuba, worked his way over, became an LAPD officer. He was on the force. I don't know, like twenty-eight years or something, and then he switched over, became the chief of police of Mesa, Arizona. I got it right? Yes, and he, he tried to become the chief of police of LAPD and didn't make it when they were getting ready to appoint one, and he was in the running. He didn't make it, and that's, and that's when he ended up leaving. Mm. Then he winds up in San Francisco, courtesy of Gavin Newsom, who recruited him to go to San Francisco. I think it was to be chief of police or DA? Chief of police. Hmm. And then he switches over to DA. He goes to law school at night becomes a becomes an attorney but not, doesn't practice law and then he becomes a DA of San Francisco and then it all starts unraveling on him. Hmm. all of his experiments with a uh, you know criminal justice reform and the city of San Francisco just fell apart now it's looks like one big crime scene you should put yellow tape around the whole city of San Francisco wow, that's unfortunate call it a day man that's really that's unfortunate isn't it? yeah um, and the things we've had to do here recently, unfortunately and tragically, when an off-duty LAPD officer lost his life uh, in the county area because of the lack of confidence, the lack of trust in Mr. Gascon, Mr. Villanueva made sure that when the suspect was arrested, the case, as opposed to being filed locally through the DA's office, took it to the feds. They filed it because... Mr. Gascon would not file exigent circumstances, would not file anything other, any enhancements other than a straight out murder, when in fact it's a death penalty case. Right. And so the feds took it over. Uh, the people from LAPD, the, as I call them, all of us at this level were all the working swine. They applauded the actions of the sheriff's department, picked up so many followers for uh, the mm -hmm. sheriff, and they're doing that. And I just understood that the, uh, I want to say the DA in maybe Ventura County, there was a 17-year-old kid that uh, Gascon would not file as an adult, and they took it over. They filed it, and they're going ahead. They're going to serve. He's going to serve time as an adult. As an adult. As opposed to getting out of. Oh. 
Now that how- case is actually George. That case is even. It's not. It's like more than that. As a 17 year, I think two months or two week, 17 years, 11 months, two week, he molests and sexually assaults a 10 year old girl in a Denny's restaurant. He goes on the run for years. During that time, he goes through a crime spree in three different states. DNA evidence catches up to him. He gets arrested. Now he's 25. <clears throat> now Gascon is a DA and he wants to file the charges in juvenile court instead of trying him as an adult. At the same time as this unfolding, he has the guy, as soon as he was arrested, he became Hannah overnight, as soon as the handcuffs were on. His name was James before that. So now he's Hannah. Now Gaston puts him in female juvenile detention facility. And this guy is a a multiple, you know, violent offender, predator. And now Kern County arrests him for a murder that happened several years ago. And just yesterday, he was held to answer. It was actually it was Kern County, Kern uh, County. DA's office. They got him held to answer on a murder charge for a crime. He assaulted and killed a fellow homeless person in Kern County, I think back in 2018 or 19, something like that. So the law caught up to him now. He was also, they have a recording of him talking to his dad, making fun mm-hmm. of us going in L.A. County. Hey, these guys are going to let me out. They're going to hold me for two more months. Then I'm going to get out of jail. That's all they can wow. do. Wow. Yeah. How, how, did Gascon, how did Gascon want to be the DA, but then not want to enforce penalties and, and crime? You know, that's the million-dollar question right there, because as soon as the very first day he took office, he talked about reform, the George Floyd murder to happen. So everybody was all buzzing about criminal justice reform. Defunding police was popular in liberal circles. So he shows up his first day in office, he comes down like Moses from the mountain with a tablet, his special <laughs> directives, and said, this is the law of the land now. And of course, his own department said, what are you talking about? We have to hold people accountable. Yes. So the clash started his first day in office. Wow. Even his own people, they file lawsuits against him. Uh, it, it's just been so tragic. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, his father was killed in the line of duty with Inglewood. Uh, the suspect was coming up for parole recently. Gascon would not send any representative from the DA's office to the parole board hearing to fight to keep him in custody. Fortunately, there was a captain from Inglewood Police Department that did go down there and represent that man, and so now the guy remains in custody. Yeah, uh, it's, it's just tragic what, what I've seen after all these years in law enforcement that I've been a part of, and now to watch it, is ki- it's killing me. How does a writer like Gustavo Ariano zero in on you and just become so obsessed with you that he's churning out these articles really only about you? Well, I, I said he had, used to have an article in Orange County Rest, um, Register. It was called Ask a Mexican. So I said it should be called Ask a Vendido because that's all he's done. Yeah. He's a designated times if you need to bash the Latino, let's go, Gustavo's our go-to guy. Mm-hmm. And he, he does that with relish. He won't talk about anybody else but Latinos. Uh, yeah, he talked about me. <laughs> there you go, Sam. Not very few people, yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people talk about people. I was like, oh, why would this guy say these things about me when, I don't know. But, yeah, you see it. And, um, you know... I, I saw a video, you know, I'm from San Fernando, and I saw a video of that of uh, the sh- you know the guy swung on the sheriff, right? He was being led uh, mm-hmm. underground there, and he swung on, which I believe he was the he turned around and swung at the sheriff, and you know they they, they traded a couple blows, they got him down on the ground, and uh, they put their I think the guy had his knee on his head, which is probably mm-hmm. maybe a, a restraint that they use, right? I mean, you want to want to, I mean, not the neck, but. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know either because I'm no longer with the department. I don't know what their policy is. But I don't it, want to speak to their policy. But if you control the head, you control the body. That's what I would. You know. I, I don't care what what policy you control the head, you control the body. Yeah, that's just physics. I'm sure people would not who were listening to this or watching this would say, "How can you say this now?" But I mean, there there are restraints that are used in properly, and there's restraints that are used mm-hmm. improperly. And um, uh, should that inmate have been handcuffed, you think? I know he wasn't handcuffed. 
oh, that, well, that inmate assaulted the deputy. I think he punched him three times. Yeah. Try to. Yeah. I think uh, he needed to be taken down. He needed to be restrained and handcuffed. Now, that's why we have investigations to determine whether or not he acted properly. We don't make assumptions based on videos. We have to do a thorough investigation. Right. We have to ask all the people, what were you trying to achieve? Were you aware of what you were doing? And all of this, but the people wanted to jump to the gun because they think it's George Floyd part two. And it's right. just a false narrative. Right. Yeah. Sounds good to me. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, you know, you want to say that it's, it's just that I, I just think that when people see something, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to say that. I think we're fixed on what we see first and not what we know. I mean, I think people are fixed on what you see and not what you what you know is true. And not just about yes. that. I just think about everything. If somebody's in a coffee shop and you hear somebody talking about somebody and then somebody says, who are you guys talking about? And they say who it is. They might say, yeah, I, did, I didn't hear that. But or say, I believe that. I mean, not nobody. It's almost like no one has their own individual idea anymore. In its simplest form, in my mind, the, the analogy I use is when I was a kid growing up, if the school called or something happened in school and my parents found out, it was my fault. Yeah. And they're not going to run and blame the school. Today, anything happens to kids in school and they run and the first to blame is it's the school's fault for not taking care of their kids. You know, it's yeah. their, their fault. In days of old, you messed up with the cops, it's your fault. Today, because of even before, just before George Floyd, everything that goes on with these now cameras on everybody mm -hmm. with their phones, it's the cop's fault and you see it. And yeah, I know what's happened to me before and the guy pulled me over and he was a chicken shit. You know, the way they treated me, everything's now is the cop's fault. And mm -hmm. who are you gonna call when you're in trouble? Right. That's what I, we, what uh, you probably very familiar with that phrase, me or no? You know, not my son. Mm -hmm. Right. And actually, it's we will see. And people just don't want to believe it. But I, from what I, one thing I learned from school, going to the graduate school is, you got to be able to ask yourself the question, how do you know what you know? And then find out, okay, where does the information come from? How credible is the source? And then when you start picking apart, you dig a little further, you realize, okay, I'm being pulled along here, or there's merit to it, but make the decision yourself. Not that someone is spoon feeding you, you're just gonna slurp it up like a faithful puppy. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what would you say to people out there that are possibly thinking about becoming a law enforcement officer, but uh, maybe because of the times might not, you know, uh, it might it might hold them back. I mean, I know I know that we're underserved, but there has to be people out there who are qualified to to be officers. I'm not sure if if they're a little bit reluctant of because of what's going on. But uh, in order to recruit um, new officers and deputies, they have to come from someplace, and you're the top of the top. What would you say to someone out there that m might consider you know being in law enforcement? Well, if we can lift the hiring freeze in LA County, we're gonna hire them. And we have a very good track record of attracting people. But the profession, you're very right, George, the, profesh the profession as a whole is having a hard time attracting recruits from the new generation of kids that are graduating from high school, maybe joining the military, that age group right there, mm -hmm. 18, 20, 21. It's not easy because the media has so demonized the profession that people are kind of thinking twice, man, is it worth the hassle to dedicate my career to this? But within the department itself, we're in real good shape now because people want to be LA deputy sheriff. So it's, we're kind of an anomaly in that regard about recruitment side, but yeah, for the profession as a whole, that is, that is a very big problem. Not only is it a problem here, it's probably, it's a problem everywhere nationally. And, and I know um, firsthand, my grandson, 22 years old, two years ago, he was saying, I want to become a cop. I want to become a cop. And I said, son, what about thinking about becoming a fireman? Everybody loves a fireman. Nobody loves a cop right now. And he said, no, my dad's a cop. He says, no, I want to be like you, Papa. And I said, okay, I'm not here to help you, but I'll, I'm here to support you. And that was his decision. Uh, a couple of years later, he's decided, maybe that's not for me. Mm -hmm. And and I was, 
happy that he made a decision. I said, well, it's good. He was afraid to disappoint me. Said, you're not going to disappoint me because if your heart's not into it, you're not going to be a good cop anyway. You know, it's, it's better for you. It's better for the citizens. This job isn't for everybody. But if you've made that, once you made that decision, you can be great. You, you just, you've got a heart, treat people, there, and, and they're treating, they're training them properly. So all you got to do is remember where you came from, treat people the way you'd like to be treated, and it's a great job. They teach you how to stay safe. Right. You know, so God bless them, and I'm here to support them. But also, is it, a, is it a bit like it used to be, or could it be where, you know, where people in the community knew, I remember, I think in, in uh, parts of Los Angeles, they have like breakfast with a cop, is that what it's called? Like where you get to, you get to have a police officer come mm-hmm. and you can, you can uh, ask him questions about what's happening in, in the neighborhood. But if you're going to live in the LA County, you're going to have to accept some responsibility for what happens in the county, whether you leave packages in your car, whether you leave your bike on the porch, there's people out there who are hurting and who are suffering and who might be addicted to drugs and they're going to look for something to, to steal, to sell, but you can't, uh, you know, you have to accept some responsibility for how you live as opposed to just leaning back afterwards and saying they took my bike and they took this and they took that. But, you know, there has to be a smarter way to get to do things in the neighborhood, I think. Within the last yeah, month we at my house, I've seen on my cameras guys in the middle of the night, three in the morning, coming by, checking doorknobs or <laughs> car, car doors. Can they get in there? Is there anything in there? Looking and checking if they can get in. That's within the last month where I live. So they're out there. I, I have that app on the, you know, the I have the ring door installed, mm-hmm. like most everybody does. And on the neighborhood watch the app, they share, hey, have you seen this guy? And it's always it, just like you said, that guy at two in the morning, you know, trying to get into cars or going through the porch and all that stuff. So got to harden the target for sure. What can people do um, all around the country or around the world to make their, to make their, um, area where they live a little bit safer for them everybody has i'm sure ring cameras and all that but how do we how do we just open our eyes to things that are out there that we might not see well one thing we got to do is we got to practice a simple rule is don't be a pendejo for starters yeah there's too much things happening that people are clueless of that they need to start looking at in a different light if you're advertising all the fancy big screen tvs you have in your house with a big bay door window open facing the street while you're advertising the people hey come take my stuff Mm -hmm. if you're advertising on social media that you're having that great vacation in europe that means you're not home so Mm -hmm. someone's going to come and clean out your house Mm -hmm. and there's things we do personal safety don't go you know young ladies should not be getting gas at night in the gas station or or going to the atm machine if you see someone hanging around an atm machine he's waiting for you to get there to pull out cash Right. So people just need to be aware of their surroundings a bit. Practice a little more situational awareness. It's going to go a long way to improving their safety. And same thing with the mail, with email and all that. Government only operates by mail and nothing else. We don't call you to say right. we have a warrant for your arrest. Right. But how many people fall for the, this stuff? Yeah. Yeah, they do. They really do. I mean, that, that scam, uh, the scam about fishing or they call it fishing where they're looking for your information Mm -hmm. uh um the 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 guy who climbed up on stage at the hollywood bowl and ran at dave chappelle um i know dave chappelle and and his shows like put phones in sacks and they 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 seal them up so you can't use your phone during the show but this guy had a weapon that i don't think i've ever seen it looked like a gun but it had a blade in it right it wasn't a gun but it was a gun looked like a gun but a but it ejected almost like a baton a, a baton a knife uh, um, mm-hmm. it, what, 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 once he jumped on the stage and touched Dave Chappelle, what's that charge right there? Well, right there now, you're already at the point of assault and battery. The moment he uh, ran towards him, yeah, and then when he tackled him, this is where it's subject to interpretation. I've talked to people that are former DAs that say I would have filed on a felony, and if a and if a jury wants to break it down to a misdemeanor, that's fine, but I'll go for the felony based on the intent and the action itself. He was armed at the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's different ways to slice or dice it, but Gascon took the cheapest route possible because he's always trying to minimize uh, ex- exposure to criminal you know, consequences. 
I mean, trying to minimize exposure to consequence, it was done in front of 18,000 people. And because it was Dave Chappelle, it was all over the world. So all of a sudden now, mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's not a felony. And people are saying, like, I mean, why not? So it makes it makes the city look weak, look weak when it's one guy that that's weak, and not all law enforcement, and not this, and not the city. It's it's the DA who's the guy who is there to enforce. I mean, that that guy jumped on stage, and you know, and ran at him, and 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 that, and <clears throat> I think even Chappelle was shocked that he didn't uh, receive a felony uh, charge. He did. He complained about it. He wanted yeah. one. Yeah, and and. Uh, um, I mean, with that, I mean, the security at the Hollywood Bowl, I'm not sure is necessarily the tightest because it's the Hollywood Bowl, it's outside. I believe even some comedians that I've talked to uh, were even, had even let the Hollywood Bowl security know, like, hey, this guy's not supposed to be right here, and he's been here, and he was right, getting ready to leap, but nobody ever, nobody ever went to him and said, hey, man, can I see your ticket, or you got to go back to, to where you are? And I think he was warned before that so even if somebody had spoken to him it could maybe could have been prevented you know by, mm-hmm. by security because there's not the hollywood bowl has their own security and i'm not sure how uh strict they require their their security to be but clearly with us with a low stage at the hollywood bowl this guy was able to to run up there i mean remember Chappelle has the lights in his eyes and he can't really see what's going on until the guys are right. right up right up on him so i think anybody any performer anywhere would want to know that if, uh, or any citizen would say that if you're ever attacked by someone, that the DA can't be looking to make it a misdemeanor and not a felony. Well, the sad thing is that, you know, they're trying to turn a profit in the show. So one of the places you cut corners is on security. So you don't hire full-time cops. LAPD has a contract with the Hollywood Bowl. Even though it's a county facility, LAPD has a contract. However, they're relegated to the exterior. And only if the private security raises their hands and says, hey, we got a problem, then they're not involved, so by design. But so the screening of people coming in with metal, yeah. that's private security. The security around the stage, private security. Mm-hmm. Wow. And uh, I think tighter security could have prevented this, but that's an issue of the operators of the bowl, the venue, really it falls on their shoulders. I remember when, unfortunately, you know, Kobe Bryant was a friend of mine at GGSR grew up, that the, that that day in January that the uh, accident happened, you were the first person to speak. You were at the site, but also you said that you grounded the sheriff's the sheriff's helicopter that day, and you know that day in uh, was it 2020, that the whole uh, January maybe 22nd or whatever day in January every day was clear in the morning except that day was the first day it was really 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 very overcast um why would a pilot fly that day why why would why would a helicopter get in the air and not file a flight report because a flight report tells everybody that you're going to be in the air right Mm -hmm. if you file and you say i'm going to be in the air yeah they they file a flight plan before they leave and uh I've been in the air in the vicinity with with uh, our helicopter pilots, and they've explained that this all was operator error, mm-hmm. that there were specific rules when there's visual flight rules, mm-hmm. and there's things you don't do. But his desire to get his client from point A to point B with minimal hassle, he could have landed at Van Nuys Airport, I think, mm-hmm. was the the default place where he should have landed, it would have avoided the whole mess. Mm -hmm. And then I'd rather be inconvenienced than, you know, flying to a hillside at 160 miles an hour. So Mm -hmm. that, unfortunately, that's human, human error right there. You know, I know that he got to almost where the LA Zoo is and then circled for half an hour because he didn't have a plan on the guy. You could hear the guy saying, hey, you know, I got planes coming in, man. You got to like hold. Uh, and he did circles around kind of the zoo area and then tried to get to the next place. Then when he passed Van Nuys, um, you know, I've gone, and I think Arsenio as well, you know, Arsenio lived in that area, and, he, and that morning he sent me a picture of his backyard or in, and his front yard, and he said, every morning I can see my gate, and you couldn't see anything. And even in that area by Las Virgenes is that, that it gets – like a bowl, it gets really foggy, and even if you're in a car, all of a sudden you're clear, and then you go in there for whatever reason that that area has been carved out of, it just becomes this 
maybe two mile by two mile thing of of just you of just soup and like you can't see where you're going i'll tell you right now there's nothing more frightening to me when i was in vietnam a couple of times we ended up going into the clouds like that in the fog and there was nothing more frightening to hear one pilot or tell the co-pilot the co-pilot tell the pilot you take over i got vertigo because you literally can't see and you can't feel and you don't trust your instruments and we're there and we're looking and, and, and it's the scariest feeling in the world and and, and, a, and a, um I mean, you're within seconds of having to make a decision, and if you get a little bit, uh, what do they call it, the uh, spatial uh, thing, but you're, you're disorientation, you're disorientation, and you don't know where you are. I mean, it happens to the best pilots. I think I don't. I'm not sure. I mean, I think they took that same flight the day before. The day before was the day before us. It's not that day, and that day was mm-hmm. was extremely uh, awful conditions to be up in, and also, you know, that helicopter did not have the up-to-date system of you know terrain and uh, all the things that would would let you know from all around you that you were you were in an area that you needed to either go up on you know yeah he did not have the ability to fly by instrument without having the visual and uh our we have an aircraft or two but one that's a rotary wing our air five they can fly through that but that requires a pilot a co-pilot and all the instrumentation they have to read everything and they're sometimes stuck doing rescues in those conditions, mm-hmm. but they have definitely two uh, two sets of eyes instead of one, and they have the full instrumentation panel that they can rely on to do that safely. And then, of course, fixed wing aircraft do it like nothing with autopilot, like right. our King Air or big jetliners do that, where they go through cloud blanks like nothing. And uh, but man, helicopter, that I, I take my hat off to helicopter pilots. It's such a busy thing because you're using your left hand, your right hand, your both feet, your eyes, instruments, the horizon. It's it's a full-time job. You cannot rest at all. You know, for a while for a while it looked like um every person was going to have a drone. And it looked like drones were going to become the eyes in the sky and that you heard that Amazon was going to deliver by drone and and check this out. I even saw I saw I saw a robot like walking down Western, and I think it's a delivery. I've seen those. Does it make sense that it's a delivery robot? I've yeah. gotten one of those before. Uh, I saw one on 9th Street in downtown LA. Went by. It had six wheels and a little flag, and it was delivering food. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. Don't you think? That is until the homeless person just pushes it over. <laughs> exactly. And then that ends up delivering. <laughs> Then it ends up in the. Uh, 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 but dro- but drones. Uh, it, uh, the, the 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 restrictions on a drone must be um, really really a lot of them to 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 know that. As citizens of whatever city you're in, you don't see drones in the air very much anymore. No, there's a lot of restrictions you have to comply with. There's a ceiling you can't operate past. You can't be near a large venues and you know transit corridors. Uh, Super Bowl, for example, we had a huge area. There was no drones going to be allowed. And we have the ability with the FBI and, and the FAA to ground all drones. We send a message to the drones that forces them all to go to the ground. Wow. So a lot of countermeasures because they pose a, a serious threat. Yeah, they do. They do. All right. Well, listen, man, I, I, uh, I'm appreciative that, uh, that you've come on the show um, and that you uh, – you know, are here with us. I, I I don't know you personally. We've never met before, but you know, we talked for a while. And and I have to say, I I, I admire you, man. I admire you that you that uh, you stand up to uh, everybody, and that you know that uh, in Los Angeles is it, it can be a better place to be, and and that you're one of the people that's trying to make it a better place to be. And you know where I stand, Sheriff. All those that are listening, I hope you support. We're there, and uh, we'll be celebrating. Well, thank you all. I appreciate George and Gil and Mr. Producer. Thank you for the opportunity. We're, I'm just trying to make L.A. livable for everyone, and that's my focus entirely. Beautiful. Great. All right, Alex. Thanks thank you, boss. Maybe we'll see you Thursday, I think. Yes. All right. Whatever. You got it. Right on. Thank all right. You.